for the first for the for the first couple of weeks. There's a lot of reading throughout the course. But are there any questions about as you went through the materials or what I said last time? Are there any questions about it? Yeah. I'm going to talk specifically now this week now for the for the about what you need to understand to do the first week checkoff, which is a week from yesterday or today. So I'm going to be talking about simulation and and the the actual solver mechanism. But any more general questions than that? So to talk about, of course, stop, stop me at any time. But what we need to talk about for lab one is the solver, which is going to be today. And um, to some extent, model sim Then we need to talk about for week two. Check off. We need to talk about logic analyzers and, and testing. Then, oh, and also VGA output because there's a VGA output requirement for week two, week one, week two. Then, for the after that, we need to talk about parallel I/O ports. You have a parallel I.O. port between the HPS and the FPGA. So from the viewpoint of the arm, the FPGA is the outside world. And therefore, PIO port output, it output is HPS to FPGA. The rest of the world is evolving. And then using MMAP, as the link between the HPS C code and the memory map that allows you to manipulate the FPGA. So this is going to be HPS to FPGA, which will be required for the, for the final product, so to speak, for the, for the whole solver. So to start in on, on the actual solver itself, what we need to solve here is outlined in the, in lab one, and it is a set of three differential equations, first order differential equations. They're nonlinear, and there's a there's constants associated with each of the uh, differential equations, and of course because we're going to use discrete time, we have to have a time step. And what I did a long time ago, two or three years ago, but uh, modified last year, was to ask, uh, with all this parallel hardware, can we make a parallel analog to the digital computer that acts like an old parallel analog computer. The first computer I ever worked on in college was an analog computer. I did all my physics one uh, data analysis on an analog computer because the waiting line for the THE digital computer was 100 people long and the waiting line for the analog computer was zero. I learned an analog computer. And with an analog computer, if you're going to solve a second order equation, this is just a generalized form of, of first order equations as a function of everything. Let's say that you, um, you want to solve this differential equation. Ah, there's a touch screen. You want to solve this second one differential equation, spring mass equation, damp spring mass equation. Remember that from physics? <gasps> we can break this down and we can factor this into two first order equations. You can do this fairly trivially by substitution of variables. And 
So the first, so the first derivative of the position is the velocity, and the set first derivative of the velocity is acceleration, which is given by the uh, ratio of the force to the mass. And if we were going to wire this up on an analog computer, we would do this. We have an integrator, op amp. Another integrator, another op amp. A multiplier, well, multiplier module, buy from analog devices. You multiply these and multiply you add this together using another op amp. You can, and we know that the, that the, that the, Second derivative is the acceleration as a function of velocity and position, and we can just calculate that feedback and like magic. The closed loop does as our, uh, a simulation of a spring mass system. So if you let this thing run, you get damp sine waves. And the goal was to reproduce that on FPGA. You wire together stuff on the FPGA, and it becomes the dynamic system that you want to solve. So what we're going to do here, the overall scheme is going to be, we're going to write a solver, which is a set of, set of three integrators and associated uh, electronics on the FPGA. This is on the FPGA. The R of HPS, our processor system is going to feed across the QSYS bus the parameters necessary for the solver to work sigma, beta, rho, delta t, and a couple other things, initial conditions. And the solver is going to send back, when requested, an update of the three dynamic variables x1, x2, x3. So x1, x2, x3. So the solver is going to do the numerical integration and send back the result. Then the HPS is going to reformat this as pixels, send it out across the QSYS bus, back over to a VGA interface, And then, of course, you're going to put that on our monitor. We have a whole stack of spare VGA monitors. Please do not disconnect the monitors from the desk systems. We have piles of spare monitors. So this is going to go out to a monitor and you'll be able to look at a waveform. And this is pre-made IP I'm going to give you. We're going to be talking about how to hook this stuff on the QSYS bus, but not today. And what you are going to need to simulate next week is the solver piece. So your test bench, the test bench that you write to run the solver, is going to pretend it's the arm. It's going to give the system the initial conditions, the constants to solve the system. The solver is then going to blast out a solution and at the top level, then you're going to output those waveforms on the as on the simulation uh, interface and verify that they match the math language. Okay. Any uh. Any questions about this? Oh, yeah. Just to give you an idea of what this looks like, there's a there's a there's a common way of of showing the trajectory uh, trajectory in x y in x one x two x three space, which I'm not going to ask you to do on the FPGA, although it's tempting. And that is as a three dimensional state space. So. Here we have x1, x2, x3 space, and the trajectory of this system through the state space is extraordinarily complicated. 
There's a double scroll effect with the system swapping back and forth between the two scrolls in an almost random looking way, which is in fact deterministic, but sensitive to initial conditions, so you can't predict what it's going to happen. And I'm going to ask you to not put that on the VGA, but to, in model sim, record the data in a, a uh, comma separated uh, file, a CSV file, and slurp it into MATLAB and make a plot. So you can show that your simulated system does a double scroll effect like this in 3D. Couple of couple of examples from last year. This was a whole pile of uh, of points imported into MATLAB. Another example, slightly less dense. You can see that the dynamics is at least qualitatively correct. What I am going to ask you to plot on the VGA screen is this. Three plots, x1, x2, x3, and this is student output from last year in glorious color, and, a, and the actual presentation will be that the system draws across the screen at a rate slow enough that you can understand the drawing. It doesn't need to be this slow, but it should, it should be instantaneously fast. It should go across the screen. And when the image gets to this edge, one of two things has to happen. Either you have to start scrolling the whole image across the screen, which requires a high rip write rate, because you've got to erase a whole ton of pixels. It's an FPGA, you can do that. Or you have to treat it like an oscilloscope and restructure. You never know quite what you're going to get as the next image. And so you're either going to scroll across the screen or you're going to act like an oscilloscope and erase a small region in front of the current drawing point and go across the screen and leave what's already there up and just erase a little bar in front of where you want to draw next. So that'll be the final version, but not the simulation. Any questions? So you need an integrator. Well, in a in a in a discrete system, in a discrete system, an integrator is just an adder where you're going to take some function of inputs, some messy function of all of, of the vector of all state variables, and perhaps time. Hmm. You know, you know what a system of differential equations that doesn't depend on its own dynamic time is called? Autonomous. Anyway, all of a sudden we're going to deal with this autonomous. And we're going to then multiply the input function by dt and make an Euler integrator. This is the simplest possible digital integrator. It is also, of course, the least accurate. You can do better. If you go to the, uh, the, one of the DDA pages I've written, you can figure out, you can see how to do a Hune uh, algorithm. It all it triples the work you got to do. But <clears throat> it's a lot more accurate. So we're going to take the input function, multiply by dt, because this is now the rearranged version of the differential equation, which takes the first derivative term, multiplies by dt, and adds it to the current state. We have the current state of the variable. We're going to add it back to the weighted version of the dt weighted version of the input function and produce a new output. Is it clear to everybody why that's a 
An integrator? Yes. No. No. Okay. So, <clears throat> we need two modules to actually do this. We're going to have two modules. I'm going to give you two modules to do this. One is, we need the state machine which runs the time dependent uh, register addition. And then we need a combinatorial multiplier because our system is, is, is nonlinear. We're going to be multiplying x1 times x2 and x2 times x3. So we need to be able to do a multiplier. So we need a, uh, a, a fast multiplier. The chip we were, are using, the Cyclone 5, has 87 27 bit multipliers on it. All of which will absolutely run at 100 megahertz and probably 300 megahertz. You can do a lot of multiplies. So we're going to grossly underuse that system for this first lab, but that's okay. <clears throat> Furthermore, we need a number system which works well with the FPGA. And what I'm going to suggest is one of two things. I'm going to strongly suggest that you use 27-bit fixed point. And what I think you want to do is to use what I would call 7.20 fixed point, where a number is represented by 20 bits of fraction. So this bit is the binary point's right there. This bit is 2 to the minus 1, and this bit is 2 to the minus 20, and this bit is 2 to the 0, and this bit is 2 to the 1, and then the top bit is a sine bit. We'd be using 2's complement, 2's complement, 720 notation. So, the nice thing about two's complement fixed point is that if you want to build an adder for two's complement fixed point, it is no different at all than an integer adder. The only thing that's different is how your brain interprets the numbers. So the FPGA hardware for uh, adder just works. For a multiplier, you have to be a little more careful. So if you multiply two numbers that are both in 720 format, you're going to get something that is uh, 54 bits long. Right? 54 bits long, 0 to 53. It's 54 bits long. The bottom 20 bits is going to be underflow. The next 20 bits is going to be the fraction that you care about. The binary point, if there's 20 bits here, the binary point must be at 40 bits after you've done the multiply. So the binary point is at 40 bits. And now you have, instead of 7 over here, you have 14 bits, of which 6 is significant, another 7 is overflow, and the top bit is the sine bit. So you're going to do a sine 27 by 27 multiply, which results in a 54-bit result. Remember, FPGAs don't care how long the word is. It could be a billion bits long. As long as you get enough memory, you can make a long word. 54-bit word, of which you're going to need to select out this select, this section, and this one, concatenate them together to make the final 27-bit multiply result. Okay, now, with that in mind, let me show you the modules. 
I uh, abstracted these into a little code snippet here, so for your viewing pleasure. And uh, ignore the clock divider. You, I, I, I slowed this down for, for technical reasons because I wanted to tune it to a, a musical scale, but, but you're not going to do that. So we have an integrator module that's going to have a BN plus one output. So this is the new estimate of the state variable. This is the function input that's going to be the first derivative function of that variable. There's going to be an initial condition because every integrator has to have an initial condition. A, a clock that clocks the state machine and a reset, which when we push it, will reset the integrator to the initial condition. Typically, for your solver, that reset line is going to be run by the HPS. Because you want the HPS to be able, one of the explicit requirements of the lab is to have a reset line that restarts the calculation. So in, in Verilog format, we have to specify the bit length of everything. And there's going to be a, oh, oh yes, by default, every Verilog signal is unsigned. If you want sign, you have to say sign. And furthermore, the rules are that if you do arithmetic with one signed and one unsigned variable, you know what happens? Neither do I. It will probably default to unsigned, but you cannot depend upon it. You have to be explicit. Furthermore, in Verilog, you have to be explicit with the number of bits because the default is, oh, we're just going to use 32 bit in decimal. Nah, doesn't work. You've got to specify every width of every signal. Given that, then we're going to have a, a procedural block, which is going to be clocked on the positive edge of the clock input, which will probably also be run, the clock will probably be a signal from the HPS, which advances the solution one time step. Click, 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 click. So the clock will probably come in from the HPS, but it might be hardware. And on the positive edge of that clock, we're going to evaluate the output of this multiplexer. If reset is uh, zero, we're going to set an initial out, in other words, it's reset active low. And if reset is not zero, we're going to set the new V1 to V1 new, and V1 new is going to be assigned as V1 plus the function. And then we're going to assign an output to V1. And this is a little bit clunky notation, but it's quite safe. So it either adds in the function, something out here. There's no DT. Did I actually do that? I assume DT is part of the function. Well, it better be. V, although that's not the way I originally wrote this, um, so this is a stupid parallel question, but yeah. why is one of those register one close to fire? That's not a stupid question. That is an, a, an annoying feature of Verilog. And I'll tell, talk about that in just a minute. Uh, Yeah, yes, this is the correct version that should have the function shifted by dt. I'll fix that today. Function shift, 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 dt. 
three arrows? What does that mean? What do they know? It's an arithmetic shift. It is, a, it is a sign shift. That is right. So, Verilog has a specific separate operator for a signed shift. Now, if you give this signed shift unsigned variables, it defaults to unsigned. Whether you like it or not. This killed me for weeks all the time. So, make sure everything's signed. I'll fix that integrator right after class. Wow, so embarrassing. And the multiplier, which I believe is correct, is going to be given as a, uh, so this is a sine 7 dot 20, two's complement. We have a 27 bit output, two 27 bit inputs, a 54 bit wire, and this is going to be a unclocked combinatorial multiplier. We're going to choose bit 53, which is the sine bit, and then another 26 bits out of the center, which is going to be bits 45 through 20. You can count them out of your fingers like I do. And so the output will be in 720 format, just like the two inputs. Any questions? So the range of the numbers, if you if you look at the if you look at the range of the dynamic variables for reasonable initial conditions. Let's say we have initial conditions of x1 equals 1, x2 equals minus 1, x2 equals 0 0.1, x3 equals 25 in some who knows what units. Then the dynamic range of x1 is going to be from about minus 25 to plus 25. The dynamic range of x2 is going to be about minus 25 to plus 25. And the dynamic range of x3 will be 0 to about uh, uh, 60. Maybe 50, maybe 63. And so we ask ourselves, does that, does that, does that dynamic range fit into a 7.20 format. So 7.20 is 6 bits plus a sign bit. So the maximum number that you can represent is plus 63. And the minimum is minus 64. So it works. That's a good thing, otherwise you couldn't do it this way. So the, the number system is compatible with the range of the variables. Is that good enough? Too much drama. Is it good enough? Oh dear. We're going to multiply x1 times x2. The output of that could be as high as 620, 25 squared. So that means that the 7-bit integer part won't work, right? You'll get an overflow. There's a solution, though. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it this way. And that is, we're going to do some, we're going to commute some operators here to make sure that no multiply is ever out of range. The basic idea is that you are, at every point, going to multiply the, this function by dt, which is going to be a number much less than 1. And so if we commute this into the, do the dt multiply before the x1, x2 multiply, 
you can guarantee that the product never goes above 63. So we're so we start out with x one of n plus one and time step n plus one is equal to x one of n plus dt times sigma x2 minus x1 and we are going to commute that to this piece we're going to commute to sigma right shifted saving multipliers for right shifted by the log of dt. So we're going to choose a dt. dt is going to be chosen always as 2 to the minus n. It's always going to be a function of 2. And then log dt is going to be n. And I would say a reasonable n here would be about 6 or 7 for testing. So then we're going to mul multiply this times x2 minus x1 and add x1 in. So the next equation then is x2 of n plus 1 to be x2 of n plus p times it's x1 minus rho x3, x1 of n times rho minus xn3 minus x2n. So we're going to commute that to this piece. We're going to commute that to x1 of n, right shifted by log dt. Oh, and just like c, annoyingly like c, the shift operator has the lowest precedence of anything you can think of. So it's a logic operator, and therefore when you do a shift, you must always surround the operators with a parentheses. Or you'll be doing all of the adds first and then shifting by some unknown number. Times rho minus x3n minus x2n right shifted by LDT yeah okay okay so then the third function will be x3 n plus 1 
is equal to x3 n plus dt times x2, no, x1 n plus x2 n uh, times x2 of n. Times x2 of n, thank you. Minus beta, minus beta times x3 n. So again, commuting this piece, we're going to do x1 shifted right by LDP. times x2 of n. And is that, a, is that good enough? If I set, if I set LDT to 6, and the maximum size of x1 is 25, then you can guarantee that the shifted beta value will be less than 1. And therefore, this product cannot overflow. Okay. Minus x3 shifted by LDT. Times beta. Questions on this? I can talk about my other question about why are the registers? So, why, oh yes, why are the registers? A uh, is originally Verilog made a distinction between um, combinatorial logic which was considered a wire which took, out, which took out an instantaneous value and a register which could hold a value but in fact the modern syntax does not enforce that and so it is a it is a it is a completely arbitrary distinction which depends on where in the program you use the name if it's inside an always block, it has to be a register. If it's outside of a log, uh, always block, it has to be a wire. Just shoot me. So if you want to, you can name your file, instead of .v, you can name your file .sv, which stands for System Verilog. And then the compiler will just take the keyword logic, and you don't have to discriminate wire versus register. It's just logic. <clears throat> so, so all we have to do now is to code up in Verilog the, the mathematical, these, the, 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 the commuted version of the equations. So if I could draw it as a block diagram, I'm going to have a sigma times uh, shifted by LDT. So we're going to write a, a line of a very line that does that. A line that does x2 minus x1. We're going to put those into an adder multiplier. Multiplier. We're going to call this f1 of n. Going to go into an integrator that has a clock input and a initial condition input. 
and whose output now is going to be x1 of n plus 1, which we are then going to feed back to every place that we need x1 at the input on the next step. So this then will be renamed x1 out here and used on the next time step. All of the integrators will be updated at the same time. There will be three integrators. An integrator for variable two. Just gonna then say you have something like x1 shifted by LDT. Rho minus x1 multiply together. X3. Added to X2, right shifted LDT, fed into integrator 2 with the same clock, a different initial condition, so this is condition 1, initial condition 2, the output will be X2 n plus 1 which will then be fed back into the circuit on the next time tick is x2. Okay, so this is why you didn't have dt inside the integrator, because you are including it in the function. That's why I did that. Thanks, reminding me. Yeah, that's exactly how you write. Because I did, I did parse it out, because I needed to parse it out. What was that you, folks? It's uh, the... Uh, I need to parse that because of the number system that I chose. Thank you. I'm glad that you're paying attention. But not terrible. Uh, do I need to write out number three? Okay. So what you're going to test then are these three sets of modules. All hooked together in a in a, uh, a compute module, a solver module, and then instantiated along with the test bench in model sim for this one. Should the uh, Oh, yes, you're right. This should say plus and this should say minus. And <clears throat> so now you can instantiate an adder in Verilog by using a plus sign. That instantiates an adder. The multiplier, you're going to instantiate by making another copy of the multiplier module. You're going to instantiate a separate multiplier for all for every time you need a multiplier here. You need three multipliers. Let's see, we need one, two, we only need two multipliers. Because everything else is done with shifts. So we need two multipliers. We've got uh, 76. Yeah, okay, we're good. The Oh yeah, let me show you what's on our FPGA. We have, uh, so this is, uh, we're using the A5 Cyclone 5. There's uh, 85,000 logic elements, uh, 32,000 ALMs. Uh, that an ALM is a sort of superset of logic element. It's a six input, more or less a six input gate, a pair of flip flops, and an add carry tree so that any ALM can be part of an adder, a fast adder. Possibility is 28,000 uh, register elements, but don't do that. There is hard IP memory called M10K blocks. There are just under 400 10 kilobit memory blocks, each of which 
can be separately addressed and read and written on the same clock cycle. So you can do a lot of parallel I.O. in memory. There's also some uh, memory called MLAB memory, which actually uses up ALNs and turns the ALNs into memory, which are quite fast. There is uh, there are 87, I'm sorry, it's not 86, there's 87 multipliers, which can be sliced in half and used as two 18-bit multipliers for a total of 174 18-bit multipliers, if you can stand 18-bit arithmetic. There's five, six phase lock loops. Do we know what a phase lock loop is? Or someplace? We'll talk about that now. Um, a ton of GPIO, some, some uh, high-speed transmitters, receivers, and two, of course, ARM9s. So we have plenty of arithmetic to do this tiny project. The next two labs, lab two and lab three, will use all of the arithmetic capability there is. In fact, it will be up to you to figure out how to optimize the trade-off in lab two for, for a, a drum head. It will be up to you to figure out how to optimize the trade-off between memory accesses, DSP units, multipliers, time, and ALNs. It's a hard optimization, but that's what makes it interesting. Should you decide that you cannot bear fixed point, a student, uh, Mark Eiding, in 2015, made a, uh, a chop down uh, floating point system. The floating point system you're all used to is called IEEE floating point. Do you know anything about it? 24 bit uh, significant, 18 bit exponent, uh, sign magnitude with uh, overflow detection, underflow detection, infinity indicators, and all that. This is stripped down, it doesn't have any of that. It has uh, an 18 bit uh, significant, an 8 bit um, uh, exponent, and it's really fast. He wrote a floating point adder. I wrote a, a combinatorial adder. His takes two clock cycles, mine takes one. But the clock has to be lower speed. Uh, floating point multiplier. Inverse square root, because what they were interested in is solving gravitational attraction problems in real time. They need inverse square root to do that. You should probably figure out. And this takes a, I think, five cycle pipeline. Negate, absolute value, compare. The most amusing one I thought, because I've never seen it before, is floating point shift. And it just it, instead of, it does a fast multiply or divide by two by just incrementing or decrementing the exponent, not touching the state. So it's, it's fast and small. Integer to floating point, floating point to integer on the FPGA, and then float to uh, C float to, to FPGA float on the HPS and float to float on the HPS, get in and out of the and I wrote uh, the same a floating differ digital differential analyzer using that. It is uh, bulkier, it is slower, it produces nice looking output, particularly when you convert it from, from Euler to Hume's method. Goes from a first order solution to a second order solution. It's much more accurate, second order in time. If you've got lots of cycles and nothing better to do, you might have to look at that. So, next time we're going to talk more about model sim, a little bit more about model sim, and starting on some of the other topics. But this is a more or less complete. 
description of the soul. Run the MATLAB, play with the MATLAB, see what the system does. It produces amazingly complicated outputs. In fact, it's chaotic. Any last minute questions? We will, we will give you access to the lab and all the parts and pieces next week when I find out how many people actually are still in the course. Okay? Do not hesitate to put up a post on Piazza or email me. But Piazza is better. And uh, I read it all weekend. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>